Welcome, friends. This is Mike Williams. I had the pleasure of joining Vince Russo on his podcast to discuss my presentation on whether the Beatles wrote all their own music. The link to that presentation is in the description box below. Thanks for listening. Hello, everybody. This is Vince Russo, and I am here with a uh, familiar face. Uh, somebody that um, you know, I've I've had one conversation with. I hope to get to meet one day because I think this man is absolutely phenomenal. This is Mike Williams. Mike Williams has a podcast and a website, Sage of Quay, um, which also goes hand in hand with a channel, a Paul is Dead channel, talking about the death of Paul McCartney going back to 1966, the replacement of Billy Shears. We're going to get into a lot of that. Mike, how you doing, my friend? Doing well, Vince. Thank you for having me on the show. It's uh, It's been a while since we spoke because it took me a while to get this last presentation done. Yeah, Mike, I, I was keeping track. I was going to the website. I was watching all the podcasts. And you kept moving the date back because I have a good feel for you. I was I, I kept saying to myself, man, th this is going to be incredible. And uh, he's going to do it. There was never a question in my mind, but I also knew you were going to leave no stone unturned. No, I was going to do it. I, I made a commitment and I keep to my commitments. It's just that um, for anybody who watches the presentation, they can now see that the amount of information that I had to plow through and vet and connect the dots on was enormous. So it took a long time to go through that, especially when you have other stuff to do in life, you know, like you have a job and a family and everything else. So, but the last, I would say the last four to five weeks, I was pretty much heads down. So any free time I had, I was just focused on getting it out because I didn't want to delay it anymore. Got off your presentation four and a half hours. I watched it over four days because I wanted to take everything in. I, I took notes. Um, so, um, you know, Saturday, obviously, we all have to find things to do at this current time. So I have all the Beatles films on DVD. So the first thing I said is I'm going to watch Help. Uh, Help has always been one of my favorite Beatle movies. I think that's my favorite movie because of the music. Help and Rub a Soul are my two favorite Beatle albums. So now I'm, I'm, I'm listening to your report and I'm hearing about, you know, really during the, the filming of Help, there was a lot of marijuana involved, a lot of the usage of drugs for the first time with the Beatles. So I was like, let me let me watch Help. Let me see how these guys appear. Let me let me see if they you know appear under the influence. OK, so so I sat there. I watched Help. Mike, then I had sitting on my shelf. I have never watched this before. I had the magical mystery tour. And I said, I am finally going to put on the magical mystery tour. Mike, I put on the ma magical mystery tour. And all I'm thinking about is Mike Williams is not going anywhere. Because <laughs> Mike, I, you could probably spend five years picking that movie alone apart because I sat there and I watched Magical Mystery Tour. Not a lot is said about that film. Yeah. But when that film is complete, I'm sitting there knowing, man, there was a lot of shit in that movie that I did not get. And I've not heard you talk about that film much can you give me your little insights? Because, man, I watched that from start to finish, and I don't know what I experienced. Yeah, well, Magical Mystery Tour is all occulted. It has uh, the 9-11 encoded in it, and um, that was the brainchild of Billy. So Billy was the one that put it together. And, you know, and Billy is an occultist, plain and simple. Uh, he's heavily into the occult, uh, into, um, into magic and so on. So... Magical Mystery Tour is filled with all kinds of all kinds of symbolism. I am the Eggman. It's really uh, a play on Humpty Dumpty, fell off the wall, right? And they couldn't put him back together again, right? That's a, a Paul is dead clue. I wish I had my cheat sheet in front of me right now, but I, I would be able to take you through more of the uh, the occult that's embedded in Magical Mystery Tour. But rest assured that it's it's completely occulted. 
um, the whole thing. When it came out, it got trashed because the average person, you know, really didn't understand what it was all about because it is this kind of this crazy mixed bag of stuff, right? But what Billy did with that movie was that it, it was really filled with occultism. And for people who understand the occult, they would get very clearly what it is that the the film was was depicting. And for those that don't understand, the way this works with the in the occult and magic is if you focus on it and you watch it and pay attention to it in the occult, your focus, your consciousness focused on something gives their magic power. Mm -hmm. And they believe that that enables them to be able to, to manifest whatever it is their objectives or their goals are. If you understand the occult, you know exactly what they're doing and saying and, you know, and, and why. If you don't, it doesn't matter anyway, because they're basically usurping your energy, your conscious energy and your thoughts and manipulating it so that they can manifest what it is that they want. Mike, I learned something else, man. I was doing a little research when I wanted to come out. It, it makes me laugh because when I used to work for Vince McMahon, Mike, my whole thing was I got down to the point where, you know, I was going to write the perfect wrestling television show and he wasn't going to be able to poke one hole in it. So now as I'm doing this research, I, I'm getting excited because I'm saying to myself, on one hand, I'm saying to myself, I'm going to find something that Mike has not found. But then I know I'm going to hit Mike with something and he's going to he's going to shoot it back to me for later <laughs> because he has gone through everything. But again, today, you know, I'm doing some research and I want to ask you this, uh, uh, Thomas Hugh Harriet. Yeah. Is that his real Twitter account? Yeah. Okay, now I was going through his Twitter account and he mentions you on there frequently. And I came across the, just the clip today about Billy writing backwards. Mm -hmm. And then the, 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 um, the clip in the book about being mentored by Alistair Crowley. And I was like, oh, like I missed that the first time around. But again, he's openly saying that. And like yeah. you said, with Magical Mystery Tour, if I know the occult, I understand that movie. When when Billy is openly saying that, you understand exactly what he's saying. Yeah, it's the occult law of reversal. And in memoirs, Billy tells us in the blue version that he was mentored by Alistair Crowley in his, in his early years. So yes, uh, so everything is is out there. Vince, I mean, it's, it's hidden in plain sight. And as I've said so many times, you know, Billy has been dropping clues since day one. And people say, oh, you know, Billy's a liar. He's, he's a deceiver. Well, he's only a liar and a deceiver if you don't understand the signs and symbols and what it is that he's putting out there. It's like um, uh, Brian Ray, who is his current guitar player. I put a video up maybe about a week ago or so, and he was being interviewed. He had said that he's the best Paul McCartney ever or something to that effect watching that and you're listening to it and the average person it goes over their head but once you understand about masterful speaking where they basically they could tell you the truth but they encode it the first question you ask yourself is he's the best paul mccartney ever well isn't there only one paul mccartney so that's a very strange thing to say right yeah. so it's stuff like that um it's it's not always going to hit you over the head and be extremely obvious it's it's a lot of it's nuanced. And so you have to learn how to decode the nuances of what's being said and what's being shown. The interesting thing is with Tom, uh, before I actually released the presentation, did the Beatles write all their own music? Tom had uh, PM'd me right before I was going to release it. And uh, I wasn't going to share it with anybody uh, preview wise. I, I did share it with you because we were going to do this show, but I was going to just kind of keep it under wraps until it premiered. And Tom said to me, I'm working on an update to uh, the abridged version of memoirs called, the book is called Billy's Back. So mm -hmm. evidently, Billy sent the word down that he wants the book updated. And it's supposed to come out the summer of this year. So within the next few months or so. And Tom said to me that Billy is going to lean into the Lennon-McCartney songwriting myth. That it is not what we have been told or what most people, virtually everybody believes. So when Tom said that, I wrote him back and I said, 
well, then you might be interested in my presentation. And I sent him the link. And um, he wrote me back after watching it. And he said, Mike, this is going to speed up disclosure. You know, so this is going to really kick it into high gear. I didn't get, oh, no, this yeah. is a problem, right? It was, okay, this is a good thing. And just so that everybody knows, you know, I, I don't work with Tom. Tom and I have become acquaintances over the last four years because I've been engrossed in this for four years. But uh, Tom and I do not share what I'm doing and what he's doing. Uh, like he might say to me, he's updating the book, but I have no idea what he's putting in the book. He knew I was doing a, a presentation that had to do with uh, assessing whether the Beatles wrote their own music. But I didn't go back and report back to Tom and tell him what's in the presentation. He just knew I was doing that, yeah. you know. So it's kind of interesting how it all kind of comes together and aligns at the end of the day. So for the folks that are going to be interested in watching my last presentation, just know that within the next couple of months or so, Billy via Tom, and Billy's the guy that's playing Paul McCartney, is going to let some of the cat out of the bag himself. So this whole process of disclosure is is well underway. And it's kind of interesting, Vince, with everything else going on in the world. I think it's a time when people really are being deluged with information and examples of the illusionary nature of the reality that people think is real. Mike, I want to ask you, I, I'm, I'm going to turn to my other computer here because, you know, I, I was looking into uh, Tom a little bit today. And there was something I want you to clarify for me. And Tom was like answering like the top 12 questions or whatever, you know, about the memoirs. Yeah. Okay. This was one thing I read. I want you to clarify this for me. The question was, did you Harriet really plan this book with Paul McCartney when they met at a beach in Southern California? And he answers, you Harriet, who was only seven years old when Paul died in 1966, never met Paul. The story about you, Harriet, meeting William as Paul on a Southern California beach one hot day after Paul left the recording studio in Los Angeles is merely a legend that was invented in chapter 35, which is fictional, to explain this book. In chapter 35, where his story, if chapter 35, were historically accurate, that disclosure to you, Harriet, would have constituted a breach of William's non-disclosure agreement, which William would never do. Hence, everyone can be certain that that chance meeting never occurred. Is you, Harriet, telling us here that he never met Billy? He's saying that the decision and the discussion to do the book did not take place where they said they, a, a beach, right? Right. Yes. Right. Yes. That yes. didn't happen. That's, that's fiction. So they openly admit that that's a fictional aspect of the book. Now I will explain how I believe it worked. The Masonic structure is just like a corporation. It's a pyramid, right? So if you work for Exxon or any large corporation, you know, you have your CEO president at the top and then it just branches down. So what happens is think of Billy as having his own pyramid and his own enterprise, if you will. When it came time for Billy to disclose, he then went out and looked throughout his corporate structure, if you will, his pyramid for the people that had the right skills and resources to do the work. Tom is a Freemason. Billy at this time, is in the what I refer to as the illuminated degrees. In other words, he's above the 33rd degree of Freemasonry. So the way it works is you have the 33 degrees of Freemasonry, then you have 13 degrees of the Illuminati, and above that, there are 20 degrees that are just basically unknown. They're in the shadows. These are people and beings we will never, never know about. So when it came time to, uh, to put the book together, they went out and they tapped into their network. And what Tom did tell me in an email going back a while ago is that he was specifically trained to do encoding. And he explained to me that at the time when it was happening, now I don't know when it took place. I'm assuming it took place when he was younger, when he was a kid. 
that when he was going through this training, he had no idea what it was for. And this is how it works. So how it works is all of this stuff that they do, when I say they, we're talking about the pyramid of power, the Freemasonic structure, the Illuminati, everything is planned years and years and years in advance. So they nurture and groom people along the way. Many times these people don't even know that they're being groomed and brought along. And then it reaches a point where their skills are honed and these skills can now be used to, to do whatever. In Tom's case, it was to encode the book. And the work that it took for Tom to encode that book is mind boggling. Mm -hmm. Absolutely mind boggling. And whenever he has to do an update, like he had to update the memoirs of Billy Shears from the first edition, which is dated 2009, to the Blue Book, the second edition, which was 2018, he had to make sure that all of the pages, all of the encoding stayed in place with updates. I, I can't even imagine what it was like to sit there God. and have to put that all together and keep that encoding intact. It was just unbelievable. Yeah. So that's how it works. So that depiction of how they met is, is fictional. Now, I've asked Tom if he's actually met Billy. And Tom told me that, you know, he can't answer that question. Okay. And that's because, you know, Tom has signed non-disclosures as well and confidentiality agreements. It's not just Billy who's bound by contractual obligations. Tom has them as well, as did the, the Beatles, by the way. Mike, if you know that he hasn't met Billy, would your feelings still be as strong as they are now? Yeah, I mean, it, it would be um, because, I mean, I, I can give you two scenarios. The one scenario would be that he has met Billy and he has conversed with him one-on-one. -on -one. It could be telephone, maybe in person, through email. So direct communication with Billy. I personally believe that, yes, he has. I, I personally believe that he has had direct communication and contact with Billy. Now, whether it was in person, I don't know. But through, like I said, electronic means, telephone, email, stuff like that, yes. But now, the other way it could work is, it's like in a corporation. When I used to work in a corporation, I never met or spoke to our CEO, ever. But our CEO would cascade down a strategy that had to be implemented that the corporation had to work on. And so people would convene and converge and they would then bring this strategy or this vision. They would make it a reality, right? They, they bring products to market and so on. Now, does that mean that because I'd never actually met my CEO, that the product that we put out or the deliverables that we put out, that somehow it wasn't really what the CEO or the president of the corporation wanted? No, doesn't mean that at all, because there is a hierarchy and there is a chain of command. And it's no different when you're dealing with Freemasonry and the pyramid and with Billy. But my own personal take is I do believe that Tom has been in direct communication with Billy. And that's just my take on it. I don't know for sure. OK, Mike, I want to ask you a question. You kind of just went by this. Uh, because the presentation, again, like I said, guys, four and a half hours, this, this, this was a life's work. I mean, Mike, seriously, the, the detail and the information in this is just absolutely incredible. However, you did make a comment which you really didn't get into where, you know, when we talk about Tavistock and we talk about that's where it all began and, and, and you know, what the Beatles were created to do. You made the comment that you think this went well beyond before the cavern, before Hamburg, before Epstein manager. You almost went back to their teens. Yeah. What 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 makes you what what brings you to that theory? Yeah, and I, I intentionally did not dive into that in that presentation, Vince, because it is a theory. And it is one that a lot of people would have a very difficult time getting their heads wrapped around. And so what I didn't want to do was I didn't want to cloud the presentation with that. Okay. But I, mm -hmm. I suspect that 
based upon what I've looked at, that it is very possible that it goes back to when they were kids. So what Vince is referring to is I had said that the Beatles were always on the radar and they were being groomed from very early ages. And I said that I believe it was possible that it started at least when they were back in Hamburg in Germany in the very early 1960s. But I do believe it goes before that, when they were teenagers and maybe when even when they were kids. And the reason why I say that, Vince, is because all these gigs they were doing, you know, they were playing nonstop, seven hours a night. I showed in the presentation, it was like, you know, two thirds of the year, they were, they were just grinding it out. And you're doing it with very little to no pay. You're living in conditions, like especially in Germany, that were just deplorable. You know, all of them sitting in a single room, sleeping at night, and, and so on. It's because they they were groomed. They were brought along from a very early age. Now, there are pictures out there, and I put it in the presentation. It was kind of my way of a little bit of a wink and a nod to people who were in the know of Paul McCartney with a bird cage over his head. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So in Illuminati symbolism, whenever you see a bird cage, a bird cage represents mind control. And you see this a lot. You'll see this a lot with celebrities, actors, and musicians, and so on. If you, you know, look at the web and you look up pictures, you're going to see them near bird cages with the bird cage on their head. This is telling us that they are in a mind control program. And so when I got when I came across the picture of Paul McCartney, biological Paul McCartney, with the bird cage, like his head in the bird cage, mm -hmm. and um, I, I believe there's also one with George Harrison, with the bird cage too, on his head. So that raised an eyebrow, and I became suspicious. I said, "Well, you know what? I think what we're being shown here and what we're being told is that they were subjected to trauma-based mind control. Trauma-based mind control doesn't take place when you're older." They have to basically break everything down early on in your life. So people would then say, well, does that mean that their parents were involved in this? I'm not going to go there because I don't want to accuse anybody of anything. All I'm going to say is, is that if they were in a mind control program at an early age, people had to know they were in these programs. Mm -hmm. Now, trauma-based mind control programs doesn't necessarily mean that everything is bad and evil. There are positive aspects of trauma-based mind control. In other words, there's a reward system. There are both negative and positive applications of it. As an example, let's just say there's a young boy that plays football, and his father is, uh, is a big-time football coach, and he's coaching the team. His son's on it. And let's just say that he's grooming his son to be a star. We've seen this so many times, right? Mm -hmm. And let's just say his son is a running back, and then he fumbles the ball. After the game, what does the father do? In, in a lot of cases, what happens is the father becomes irate. How could you have done this? You broke your focus. Get down. Do 500 push-ups. Get your head back together. This can't happen again. That's trauma-based mind control. That child, their mind is being shaped at that moment. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if that same kid on the, in the next game actually runs 90 yards and, and scores a touchdown, the father's application at that point is to rain praise on his child, pat him on the back. Let's go out to dinner, son. You did a wonderful job. Mm -hmm. You know, you're just your head and shoulders above everybody else. That's the positive aspect of a trauma-based mind control program. So there's, there's two sides of the coin, if you will. So, Billy tells us in the memoirs of Billy Shears that he was in a mind control program, a trauma-based mind control program. I mean, that's in the book. Mm -hmm. That's not up for debate. I mean, that's in the book. It's uh, one of the uh, one of the longer footnotes that Tom put in there. And although it doesn't say anything about biological Paul or or any of the other Beatles having been in any of these types of programs, you know, when I see birdcage symbolism, that makes me very suspicious. Yeah. And that's why I didn't go into it in the presentation, Vince, because it would have been just over yeah. the head of too many people. You know, they just would, what is, what is this guy talking about? Mike, I want to ask you another question because I'm just curious if these roads intersect because I've not really seen you go into this. 
and perhaps you you have and I just missed it. I've been watching a lot on Pete Best lately. And uh, you know, from from what I'm understanding, Pete Best was really maybe the most popular Beatle. Yeah, uh, he had a following, they loved him, he was very, very popular. Out of nowhere, Pete Best was replaced. Yeah. And Pete Best, when you see some of the interviews, you know, he he comes out and he says he thinks it was because of jealousy, because there was more attention on him than the other people. Do those roads intersect? Was was that a part of uh, of Tavis stock? Do you believe, or is that just a, a band outing a drummer? Yeah. So we have to. Uh, there were three phases to the Beatles, so we have to start there. Phase one of the Beatles was the Beatles with Stu Sutcliffe and Pete Best. This was the early Beatles back in Hamburg and all that stuff, right? Then we had phase two of the Beatles. This was the Ringo Starr period where we had John, Paul, George, and Ringo. And this was the the period or the phase where they were recording and playing live, doing tours and concerts and live gigs. Phase three was the Billy era, Sergeant Pepper on. Now, the thing with Pete Best is if, if we want the, I think, the, the truest story, it is in memoirs on page 350 where... Billy explains that Pete was replaced because George Martin didn't think much of him as a drummer. And so I think what they were looking at at that point was not so much recording, because I guess we'll get into that in a little bit. George Martin was thinking in terms of playing live. So the, what I took from that was Pete didn't have the chops to do the live stuff. Ringo did. So what I'm saying is that George Martin determined that uh, Ringo was a better drummer than Pete for what they needed to do next, which was to play these concerts through 1966. So if you're playing in small clubs and bars and stuff like that, Pete was okay. But once we stepped it up and we got out of bars and clubs and we got to concerts, then they had Ringo as the drummer. But as I've said in my presentation, that's where Ringo, that's where kind of like the road ended for him. In those early albums from Please Please Be, released in 1963 through Revolver in August of 1966, Ringo didn't play on those albums. Those were studio drummers that were playing on those albums. Probably a shock to a lot of people who haven't watched the uh, the presentation. So, so to answer your question, I, I believe Pete was ousted because uh, I'm going to take memoirs at its word. It's because George Martin, who was a who was the primary player, the protagonist in this whole thing, yes. decided he wasn't the guy. Let's talk about George Martin for a second, because here's one thing that I'm very, I'm, 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 I'm a little confused about. When you start off your presentation, you know, we, we hear about Brian Epstein and the meeting with uh, George Martin and the introduction of the Beatles, okay? Yes. George Martin pulls no punches, and he says on several occasions, like, they were not very good. And, 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 and again, I, I think a lot of people know this, but we, we got to go back to the cavern and the early days. They were a cover band, right? They were a cover band, but there were so many instances and, and, and interviews that you pulled out early on where he basically said he saw nothing in them that it, it, it kind of felt like they had charisma and right. they fit the bill almost like you know we could look at today we could look at NSync and the Backstreet Boys and all those boy bands you know or the monkeys the monkeys yeah it's so it, it sounded like he was saying they had the charisma they, they maybe they had the it factor but on a musical level they were lousy and the words are coming from his mouth but then we fast forward to the rubber soul and the success. And I love the one clip you have Explain to everybody what the finger over the mouth means, because you could explain that much better than me. Okay. So in Freemasonry, you know, they have this symbolism. So when you see a Freemason place their forefinger or their index finger to their lips, that's the symbol for tell no secrets. And, um, so there was a, uh, there was an interview that was in a, a DVD, which was about George Martin. It's called Produced by George Martin. And I watched that DVD, you know. And so he was being interviewed by Howard Goodall. And Howard is a composer himself. He's a broadcaster and composer. He's very accomplished. And so Mr. Goodall, during that interview, was 
asking George some questions. And then he says, I have to ask you this one question. And so George Martin says, okay, yeah, no problem. And so Mr. Goodall starts asking about the, the composition and the complexities of songs like Yesterday, Eleanor Rigby, Blackbird. And it's interesting. If you watch that clip closely, it's as if when Mr. Goodall asked George Martin that question, I don't think George Martin was expecting that question. Mm -hmm. Because if you notice, Vince, he straightens up in his chair. You know, George is sitting there. Howard asks him the question. And then George straightens up. And it's almost like, whoa. And the problem with Mr. Goodall asking that question is because he's a composer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's a formally trained musician and composer. And so when that comes from a peer and they're asking that question, that's questioning the official narrative. And so when Mr. Goodall was playing some of the, giving some examples of how the songs were constructed, remember he was playing the piano, giving some brief examples, George does this. So he's listening to, to Mr. Goodall and he still has his finger up like this. And then once Mr. Goodall finishes explaining it, you know, getting through his question and giving his examples on the piano, George then does what he does best, which is he directs the conversation, the answer back to John and Paul. He says, oh, no, they wrote it. They really did. They really did. And you know, if I had wrote them, I would have made you know a lot of money. And then I, I jumped at the clip where George Martin then says he wrote the melody line to Michelle. He says that was his composition. So when when that happened, again, it's it, when you're able to decode the signs and symbols, and you don't have to know it, all of them, just the basic ones. Whenever you see this, that's that just means you know we're going to keep silent, keep quiet, we're not going to reveal any secrets. When he did that during that particular segment of the presentation, when Mr. Goodall was asking him the question about those songs, that immediately said to me that the Beatles, John and Paul specifically, did not write those songs. And that's how I interpreted it. I mean, why would he then early on hold no, uh, you know, pull no punches about them not being good musicians? And I mean, what, wouldn't from the get-go he build these guys up to be more than they actually were. Yeah. So I think what happened was, and again, this is just a guess because it is kind of weird in, in the beginning, he's telling us that he didn't like the music. Mm -hmm. He said he thought the music was rubbish. Yeah. His yep. words, right? Yeah. Yep. That they didn't have much behind them. No, he said none of them stands above the others. Basically what he's saying is I've got an equal lot of four guys here and what do I do with them? And then he said, I'll just take them on as a band. So I think what happened, and again, this is just me mm -hmm. kind of uh, reading into it. I think initially when the Beatles were presented to him, George didn't want anything to do with them. George is an accomplished musician, arranger, composer, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and he's thinking, what, 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 what am I going to do with this? Mm -hmm. And Tavistock had a whole pool of these bands around and what they do is they have a pool of resource that they pull from. The Rolling Stones came from the same pool, by the way. The Stones are also a creation of Tavistock, as is the Who and the rest of them. I think what happened was people above George Martin said, okay, look, that's interesting that you don't like them, George, but they're the guys. They're the chosen ones. They're, they're the ones that we're going to yeah. push forward with, okay? So I can appreciate the fact that this is going to be a lot of work on your part. Right. Right. <laughs> but but <laughs> you have to go do this. Yeah. And because uh, even in the book, uh, I think it was on page 351 of Memoirs, uh, Billy mentions that the word came from a, a couple of rungs above George Martin. Yeah. So even though Memoirs does not specifically question who wrote the music, there are little clues hidden inside Memoirs that will help you to validate what I did as an example, yeah. right? It's neither denying or confirming in memoirs. Yeah. But once you kind of grab onto a specific thread and you follow it, you find that, oh, you know what? I think perhaps this is what I'm being told in the book. Because people like to think that they're all rowing in the same direction, you know? It's not the case. It's like even the way it is in business. 
you might have disagreements amongst various vice presidents or executives within a corporation. And I don't think we should go there. The other guy thinks you should. And then what happens is from a layer above or two layers above, they'll say, okay, discussion's over. This is where we're going. Yeah. And this is what we're going to do. Yeah. So I believe the same thing happened there. Yeah. Let's talk. I want to talk smoke and gun now, you know, the, to me, and, and I'm, I'm curious to hear your answer to this, Mike, to me, you know, doing all the research, uh, uh, reading the You Harriet book. I mean, everything I've been seeing since I'm a seven year old kid. To me, the smoking gun in the Paul is dead theory. The smoking gun to me is the arrest in Japan. Yeah. And then, and the fingerprints not matching up. And, and, and Billy thought, gigs up, man, like gigs right. up. That to me is the smoking gun here, like clearly. And, and I want you to, you know, go into this. The Mercy Beat article in 1962. That's a smoking gun. If if this happened in 1962, what would make you think it didn't happen in 63 and 64 and 65 and 66? Listen, Mike, you and I both listen to a lot of music. You, You are a musician. You listen to a lot more than me. But I could tell you in my whole life, of listening to music even before you put together this unbelievable presentation, there is not one musical group out there, not one, that literally changed their style year after year after year after year like they were two, three, four totally different bands, not one. Zeppelin sounded like Zeppelin. Who sounded like who? Stones still sound like the Stones. Pink Floyd, Simon and Garfunkel. I'm a writer. I there there is a way I write. When I write something, you know it's Vince Russo. Th- this was completely different from the early albums. Please please me. Then we went into the Help Brothers Soul Revolver stage. Then all of a sudden, Sgt. Pepper and Magical Mystery Tour. Then we go to the White Album. Like to think this is the same style of these same four individuals. There's no way, no how. But talk about that smoking gun in 1962 where we're told. Yeah. So in the presentation, um, and I I can't, you know, I'll give credit to one of my friends uh, who sent this to me. I won't mention them by name because some some folks don't want me (laughs) uh, to to mention their names. But they sent me this this clip, uh, an image of a Mercy Beat uh, publication from I think it was August, September of 1962. Mm -hmm. And in it, it was an article about the Beatles. And it was an article announcing that Pete Bass left the group and Ringo Starr was the new drummer. And the Beatles were flying to London to record with EMI and that the songs were specifically written for them and given to them by their producer, George Martin. It doesn't say that they wrote their own songs. It said that the songs were specifically written for them. And this goes back to 1962, right before they headed in to go record their their first album, Please Please Me. So, and actually even before that, because Please Please Me was released in 1963. So, so that, that article was unbelievable. When it, when it was shown to me, I I read that, I, I said to myself, okay, well, how are you going to get around this? Mm -hmm. You can't. You you just can't. There was a lot of information that I received, Vince, throughout that I presented throughout the presentation that maybe not as black and white as that were situations or circumstances that that we're told in the official narrative that once you really analyze it, it's not possible. Yeah, then you go through. I mean, we talk about a lot of plagiarism Mm -hmm. and a lot of their songs sounding like popular songs that were already out there it it almost seemed i i mean mike do you think there it it seems to me after watching your presentation there were many writers and those writers changed over time according to the time was that your takeaway yeah i believe that from 62 to 66 
uh, they had a core group of writers that were writing for them. And, you know, there were times when they lifted riffs from other songs, you know, and I, and I have this in the presentation. And if you watch the presentation, I, I give the examples. And, uh, you know, it's possible that they did that because they were able to get away with it. You just change up the lyrics a little bit or maybe just change the mel melody line a little bit. And uh, there you go. I mean, like I said, if you watch the presentation, I, I, I give examples of this stuff. But one of our team members, and again, I, I, I won't give out any names, but is a very accomplished composer and arranger. And um, he analyzed uh, the music and he had said that even within the 1962 uh, through 66 period, if we go back to like 1965 and 1966, where we have Revolver and and uh, well, it was in 66 and Rubber Soul in 1965, that there are stylistic differences in the music there for songs that are credited to Paul McCartney. So what this team member was saying is these are quote unquote McCartney songs, but he was able to, to detect clear differences in style in writing of those songs. So I, I believe that there was a core group of writers that were involved in that period. And I don't know how many. People have asked me, oh, Mike, do you know the names of any of these people? No, I don't know the names of any of these people. Um, these people are going to be uncredited unless somebody steps forward. Somebody like Bernard Purdy, who didn't write songs, but he stepped forward and back in the 1970s and said that he was hired to drum on 21 Beatles songs on the early records, on the early albums. Mm -hmm. So until we get more people to step forward like that, it's, it's not going to be possible to figure out who these folks are. I have been given some names by people who say that they know people who claim that they were ghost writers for the Beatles, but I didn't put that into the presentation because I had no way to validate that. I had no way to verify it. I wasn't going to put somebody's name out there uh, because somebody else told me that they believe this person was involved in that process. And then we can see, like you said, Vince, then the songwriting changes very, it's very, very different starting with Sgt. Pepper. Mm -hmm. So there was a different kludge of songwriters starting with Pepper. And I believe what happened there was, you know, Billy was the clearly the driver behind the Beatles when he took over the band in late 1966. And I think Billy then recruited people that he knew Yeah, that, you know, some of the names that I've heard, you know, popular names that were potentially in that songwriting kludge or that stream were Harry Nielsen. Neil yeah, Innes from the Ruddles. Le Lennon and Harry Nielsen were very, very tight. Yeah, Neil Innes from the Ruddles. Now, you know, because Neil wrote a lot of the Ruddles, obviously the Ruddle and the Bonzo Dog Band. He was mm -hmm. in the in the Bonzos with Billy, right? Now, I don't know whether Harry wrote the songs or whether Neil wrote those songs, but these are some of the names that have floated out there that are recognizable. Junior Campbell is another name that's popped up, but who knows? I, I don't know. But the songwriting is very different, starting with Pepper when you compare it to the pre-Pepper era, 62 to 66, very, very different songwriting. Now, Mike, you also make this statement. I'm, I'm curious to, um, I'm curious to hear your take on this. Um, if this were an opinion, or again, this was something out of uh, memoirs, but you also believe that Billy was behind the scenes prior to 67. Yeah. Billy could have been working on some of this music prior to Pepper. What brings you to that, to that thought? Well, there was an article that came out about a year ago or so and uh, where Billy said that he wrote the music to In My Life, which is a song on Rubber Soul. Mm -hmm. Billy came out and said, no, I wrote the melody, the music, and John wrote the lyrics. Now, this is a very perplexing thing. So what happened was the mainstream media at that point went into damage control. And so they said they, they ran computer models because these computer models models were able to pick up the styles of each individual Beatle. And they said, no, nah, they know him as Paul McCartney, right? They call him Paul McCartney. They said, no, nah, he just misremembered. In, in my presentation, I said, the probability that he would misremember writing a song like In My Life, when it's one of the most famous Beatles songs of all time. I think Rolling Stone had its 100 greatest Beatles songs and In My Life was number five. Yeah, And any kind of music poll of, greatest songs of all time in rock in my life ranks very, very high. There is no way yeah. Billy misremembered that. There is no way. So if we know Billy, right, we understand Billy. He likes to drop clues. This is what he does. And so I think what Billy was doing was he was saying, yeah, 
that was my song. I wrote the music to it, which means he was there before he was there. Yeah, yeah. Right? Which actually, Vince, when you think about it, would make sense because it would make the assimilation of Billy into the band a lot easier. Yeah, yeah. Because he was already working with him. It's not like, oh, I'm just going to start working with George Martin now in the creation of Sgt. Pepper. I don't think that's the case at all anymore. I really do believe that Billy was there. And I believe he was there starting in 1965. It's very possible we're hearing his influences on the Help album and Rubber Soul. Yeah, you know, you know, it's funny, Mike, that you mentioned that because it's a little sketchy. This is where you go from the fiction to the nonfiction. Again, in the You Harriet book was when five days after biological Paul was killed. I believe it was in Paris. Yeah. That, uh, and it was it Epstein. It was Epstein, right? It was in Ep France. And they, yeah. He, he met with, he met Epstein there to talk to John. But isn't that where Epstein introduced him to Billy? That's what the book says that, yeah, that Epstein and uh, Billy showed up and they were going to meet with John. And that's where Billy said that he had his, his criteria, right? And one of the criteria of doing this was that he had full creative control of the Beatles right. from that point going forward, right. that John relinquished control of the band, right? That's what's told to us in the book. Right. And then that's, in 67, you see another drastic change in music. But that still doesn't mean that Billy wasn't there. All it says to me is, is that Billy was the guy that was eventually tapped. He could still have been working with the, with the band and with George Martin prior to right. 1966, right? Yeah. So, um, and in, you know, in all likelihood, John Lennon knew who he was. Yeah. Probably just didn't know at the time that he was going to be the guy tapped to, to take the lead role. Yeah. Right. So yeah, that's, that's how I kind of read into it. We, we, we're going to get to, I'm looking at my clock cause I know how much time. Yeah, I no, have. no worries. We, we're going to get to a uh, rubber soul at the end, but th there were other tidbits. Like, you, you drop little bombshells in this thing. Cause there's so many, like it's nothing. One more thing I wanted to mention was the clip where I have Ringo explaining he called the songwriters they. Yeah, I, and, and I saw another clip where he did the same thing. The writers. I, the writers. Like, I, I said that to you, and I'm like, that's weird, bro. Yeah. He doesn't yeah. say John and Paul. He says the writers. Yeah. And, and then how many times do we I, – I, one of my uh, – my background right now on my computer is from your presentation – where the four of them are reading out of prepared book self music. Yeah. But here's another bombshell you dropped on me where I was like, oh, this was an oh, by the way. <laughs> Ed Sullivan was a part of this? Yeah. In fact, you know, um, that's in the book, The Committee of 300 by Dr. John Coleman. He explains this. But then to validate that, uh, there's a clip in the presentation where you hear George saying that, uh, I believe it was George, where he said that uh, uh, Ed Sullivan had met them in London. Mm -hmm. Okay. So a lot of people like to, uh, when it comes to the Beatle part of the book, The Committee of 300 by John Coleman, uh, they'll say the rest of the book is brilliant, but the parts in the Beatles they don't like because it basically just tears apart the story, right? Right, right. But, you know, yeah, he said that uh, Ed Sullivan uh, was, uh, he was tapped to be the focal point to introduce them into the United States and that, you know, he had made trips out to London to meet with the band and to basically get his, uh, his script and his orders as to how he was going to proceed. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Here's another, this I love, you know, I, I, I'm writing down so many of these, uh, you know, I'm going, you know, through everything, you know, Andy White, you know, uh, drummed for Love Me Do and P.S. I Love You. Yeah. Um, then, you know, B Bernard Purdy claimed to have uh, 21 songs. Then we got, you said this earlier, George Martin. They had the charisma. I thought their music was rubbish. But he is the one that's like, holy crap. You know, you're talking about the great songwriting team of Lennon and McCartney, the great composers. Quincy Jones non playing MFers. Yeah. Woof. That was devastating. That was devastating. And, you know, and then there was this, uh, again, there was damage control and where the press played it up that yeah. Quincy uh, apologized and he misspoke and all this stuff. But, you know, then I found the tweet where he allegedly apologized. Yeah. 
He didn't retract anything. Right. <laughs> right. Right. He just said, I'm sorry for bad mouthing. That's all he said. He did not take back what he had said about their playing abilities, which he said they couldn't play. Now, folks, some folks, they get angry with me for saying stuff like that. Don't get angry at me. Quincy Jones said this. I I'm just telling you what Quincy said in Spin Magazine. God, this, I mean, he's talking about the monkeys. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's unbelievable to me, but which leads us to rubber soul. Yeah. Now, Mike, I'm looking at this whole thing. And again, um, this song was written, rehearsed, recorded, uh, start to finish in 30 days between October 11th and November 11th. Correct? Right. Okay. That's the story. Now, right. That is the story. Now, to me, again, another smoking gun is the actual time it takes to manufacture an album, which we'll get into. OK, but when we look at this October 11th through November 11th, Mike, we do look at, I believe, just prior to this, September 2nd, 1965. OK, the Beatles did have a six week break or hiatus. Right. Could this music not have been written in those six weeks? People have brought that up. And the first thing I have to, you know, I tell people is, first of all, that's not the official narrative. The official narrative says that they had no existing material other than little bits and pieces of Michelle and a couple of other songs, right? But no complete songs. They didn't have any backlog of material and they were on the hook to record 16 original compositions between October 11th and November 11th. Now, people have come back to me and they have said, well, why couldn't they have written the songs during the break between coming back from the tour on September 2nd, six weeks, leading into October 11th? Well, my response to them is that, well, first of all, you're making up a new story because that's not the narrative that's given to us. But let's just set that aside for a second. Let's just say that they got off this hectic touring, which was 16 cities in 16 days, including one stop in Canada on the U.S. tour in 1965 in August. And as soon as they got off that airplane, they sat down, they got together as a band, and they started writing music. This means that the whole band would have had to convene, come together, start writing music, melodies, harmonies. And George Martin is going to have to participate because he has to do the arranging. Mm -hmm. Given six weeks to do 16 songs coming off a tour is, is really, it's not possible. People want to believe it's possible because they'll say, well, they were geniuses and, you know, they had abilities beyond even some of the most talented musicians because, you know, they were just capable of doing these things. But the truth of the matter is the Beatles have never called themselves geniuses. They never called themselves prodigies or any of that stuff. In fact, you know, John Lennon in the 1980 interview in Playboy said that they couldn't read or write music. None of them were technically good musicians. Mm -hmm. So we have to go with what the official narrative is telling us. The official narrative doesn't say anything about them writing material during a six week break. And even if they did, when they got into the studio on October 11th, they would have had to have been so polished, had those songs down to the point where they could play them in their sleep in order to make it through that 30 days. It's not feasible. Well, and it also, you know, Mike, think about it for a second. Think about it logically, because I'm really a logic guy, and I always go back to logic, and I know what it is like when we had a television taping, and we were going to record eight shows. Okay, Vince, you got to write these eight shows before we get there. You know, I mean, I know what the schedule is. Think, think about this. They know they're going into the studio October 11th to record a whole album. The narrative tells us they showed up on October 11th with nothing. So right. in other words, during those six weeks, they know in six weeks, we got to go into the studio. We have one month to record an album and they're going to go into that studio with nothing. The only way they're going to go into that studio with nothing is if that work is already done for them. Exactly. Otherwise, it makes no sense. Exactly. All those songs were written. The basic tracks at the very least and the arranging, I believe, was already done. The music for the songs 
was completely done, recorded, and already mixed down. While they were on tour and doing their thing, this is what was going on behind the scenes with studio musicians and George Martin arranging the music. And again, the official narrative says that they walked into the Rubber Soul sessions with nothing. And they had to create those songs from scratch, blank sheet of paper, starting on, on October 11th. And to be honest with you, you know, I wasn't, I didn't even pay attention or was aware of this timeline until I, I watched that DVD that I mentioned in the presentation and, you know, where the presenter is taking us through the timeline. And I got like 10 minutes into it. And I remember thinking to myself, this is impossible. Yeah. This is not possible. And, uh, and the other thing I tried to explain in the presentation, Vince, is that when songwriters write, you don't just sit down and go, okay, well, I'm going to write a song and you bang it out. And you're like, okay, here we go. Here's one song. You know, there's a lot of puts and takes. A lot of songs get started and then they get shelved because you might have a good start to a song, a good verse. You don't have a good chorus. Maybe you need a bridge, but you don't have a bridge yet to the song. It's a creative process. It's not something where you just crank it out. It's not like, you know, you're on an assembly line and that's how you make songs or how you write songs. And for people who are not songwriters, this sometimes is difficult for them to get their heads wrapped around because the official story tells us that they were basically magicians. I mean, they could just create this stuff on the spot because they were just brilliant and they were geniuses. But so many people that follow my work are songwriters and musicians. And they've come back to me and said, mm -mm, that didn't happen. Yeah. 16 songs in 30 days, starting from scratch, didn't happen. And Mike, that's only half the story. Now we get into the manufacturing and say, you know, uh, somehow, some way they were able to come up with these 16 masterpieces in, in 30 days. But now there's another problem because they're, they're, they're finished with the session by November 11th. Right. The album is they want the album to be released December 3rd for the holidays. Right. So when we look at November 11th to December 3rd, we're looking at less than a month. We're looking at literally, you're looking at about three weeks. Well, in order to manufacture an album, and Mike, I want you to take us through the steps because I don't think people really understand the finished product and what that takes. But when you look at the timeline of how, how long it takes to manufacture these albums and re release the, these albums, we're looking at six to eight weeks. Yes. They did it in three weeks. So now you've got a, a bigger issue on top of what's already a big issue. If somehow they did these show, th these in 30, in 30 days, how in God's name did they release an album in three weeks when they had to have it pressed? The label, walk us through that, Mike. Well, the thing is, when you release a record, it's not just about recording songs. Obviously, you have to record songs to have tracks on a record, but you also have to press the records and you have to create the record labels, the labels that get pressed onto the vinyl. You have to create the LP or record jackets, have photo shoots and all of this stuff. And in order to put all of that together, you have to have the names of the songs, the sequencing, what order the songs are in. You have to have the uh, the run times of the songs. Mm -hmm. You have to have all of this stuff. So the process of creating a record involves going through the printing process. It's the stamping of the records. It's bringing the records and the record jackets together and then staging the records for distribution and then getting the records out to, to retail outlets. What happened was when I was working with one of my team members who has been in the record business for a long time, he understands the record pressing process, the cycle time. He's not guessing. He knows exactly how it works. So when I was going through this and I said, okay, well, they finished up on November 11th and then the lacquer was cut on November 17th. So what the lacquer is, folks, is the lacquer is the final acetate of the record that then creates a stamper. You don't take a lacquer to make records. First of all, the lacquer has to be tested. You have to make sure that the lacquer is good, right? 
Once you go through that process, you create stampers. And the stampers are what actually press the records into the vinyl. The point I'm trying to make is this, this whole process, and it's not something that is easily expedited. And the whole bit about getting the record sleeves printed, you have to get that process started. It's called four ink printing process. Back in the day, when you created record sleeves, that had to go through a printing process. You run the four colors, it creates the actual picture, but then it needs a few days to dry before you could do anything with it. So the point I'm trying to make is that this is not just snap your fingers and everything just comes together. So there is a, a cycle time. There's a period of time that's required to be able to get a record out from the day the lacquer is cut to release when it ends up in a retail outlet. When I took my colleague through these dates and I said the lacquer was cut on November 17th and they got the records in the store on December 3rd, he said, it's impossible. I said, all right. So I said, explain to me. He said, Mike, when you print the record jacket, you have to have the names of the songs before you could do any printing. And many times on the back of the album, there's almost all of the time, there's the list of the songs. You have to know them. You can't make the record jacket and then add the songs later. It's all one process. He says the same thing with the record label itself, the round label that goes on the vinyl. You have to have the names of the songs. And he said, there is no way when that lacquer got cut, there was no time to get that printing process done from after November 11th to having the record released on December 3rd. Didn't happen. He says that process is a six-week process. And a lot of times back in the day, it's eight weeks. We used six weeks because I felt, okay, I'm going to use an expedited timetable here. Let's just say EMI pulled out all the stops to get that record out. And so I gave them the benefit of the doubt. But the truth of the matter is the six weeks that I use in my presentation is aggressive. And that the actual time period back in the day, back in the 1960s, was probably seven to eight weeks. But again, I gave them the benefit of the doubt. So I hope this is making sense. We are told the official story tells us that the Beatles finished four songs on the very last day of recording. You won't see me, girl, wait, and I'm looking through you on the very last day. So that means George Martin wouldn't have had the actual complete list of songs until the very last day. And not on, but not only the songs, the times of each song. The times of the songs. That's the, the times of the song they right. had to know. Right. So this creates a gigantic problem. It, it creates a huge, huge problem for the timetable. And the thing is, nobody has really ever looked at it before. And I wouldn't have looked at it if I didn't watch that DVD. And it was when I watched that DVD, what, see, what, what set it off for me was 16 brand new songs in 30 days. And I said, impossible. I didn't even blink. I said, that didn't happen. And then once I started investigating some more, and then it was explained to me the whole process to, to press a record and to get it out for sale in a retail outlet, the cycle time for that six to eight weeks, I'm like, oh my God, the whole thing just collapses. It's like a house of cards. So I, I hope I explained that well enough, Vince, but yeah. to net it out for the folks, look, in order for them to have had the record sleeves done in time, all of that stuff would have had to have started before they got into the studio. So what that means is the songs were already recorded, which means the songwriters wrote the songs, the songs were brought into the studio way before October 11th. Yeah, Mike, you said that in the presentation, you said that the, the wreckage should have been sent out by October 22nd for a December 3rd release. That's when it should, if, if, if this were going according to the time, it should have went out October 22nd. It went out November 11th. That's when the, uh, that's when the whole process uh, about with regard to the record sleeves would have had to been wrapped up no later than October 22nd. Mm -hmm. So what I'm trying to say, folks, I know if you watch the presentation, it's a lot clearer. It's, it's hard to do here without the slides. But what that means is while the Beatles were finishing up their Christmas shows in early 1965, then doing the European tour, filming Help, recording the Help album, and then doing their U.S. tour in August. While they were doing all that stuff, 
behind the scenes, what was going on was the songs were, were written and recorded by studio musicians, session musicians. And so this way, what happened was when the music was done, George Martin already knew the times of the songs. He knew the names of the songs. He can sequence the songs for the album. So all that stuff was done. The photo shoot was done. So we have the names of the songs. We have the times of the songs. We have the sequencing, all of that. The photo shoot. Guess what? Now we can package the album sleeves. And we can print the labels, the round labels for the vinyl. Mm -hmm. So we send that off. That's in the pipeline now. Music's done. When the Beatles show up on October 11th, what George Martin had was he had the music already recorded and already mixed down. That was already done. All they had to do was sing the songs. Based upon my work, that's what they did between October 11th and November 11th. The 30 days, they didn't write, rehearse, and record the music. They sang, a la the monkeys. And, you know, and I have clips in there where I'm showing yeah. how they're struggling with trying to get Think for Yourself down. Mm -hmm. That actual video clip, Vince, went on a lot longer. I actually had to edit it so I wouldn't bore people out of their skulls listening to it. But the bits I left in were indicative of, you know, what was going on. They were joking around. They were horsing around. They couldn't get the melody line. You could see they were struggling with the harmonies, you know. So this is why it came down to the wire. It was because, you know, this, this was a challenge for them. I know for people who haven't watched the presentation, this is going to sound like heresy, uh, but, you know. Mike, when, you know, it, it was very, uh, it was very, very, and, and it doesn't end there, but it was very, very dramatic to me when you, you know, you gave your conclusion Yeah. after all this. So my, listen, Mike, you were just so nice, man. You just sent me two wonderful albums in the mail, <laughs> uh, which I am so thankful and so grateful for. It's like freaking gold to me. And then, you, you know, you've told me a couple of times about, your ex your extensive Beatle collection. I know what a Beatle fan you are. I know what they mean to you and what they've meant to your life. How do you feel? I become actually um, numb to it in a way. Uh, I don't want to say numb, but dissociated from the Beatles. You know, it, it's it's a huge disappointment. It is. I'm not going to say that it's not. In previous shows, I've I've told folks that you know the luster is gone. But after I did this, it was really quite shocking, you know, to think that, all right, you know, we're down to they were doing the vocals. That's it. And I had to conclude that that's exactly what they were doing through the first seven albums. When you have, look, when they tell us that Andy White drummed on Love Me Do and P.S. I Love You, those are two songs that they want to tell us about. My guess is Andy White drummed on a lot more songs than those two. And Andy's not with us anymore. And I'm sure Andy had to sign some kind of confidentiality agreement so that, you know, he wouldn't say anything. Bernard Purdy, yeah. who was a world renowned drummer. He spent 25 years with Aretha Franklin. I mean, give me a break. And people want to say that Bernard's out of his mind and Bernard, I, I Bernard loved misremembered. I, I loved my, Mike has a uh, 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 footage of Bernard, which, which I loved because during this, you, you kind of seen the guy's character. Yeah. You know, you're, you're, you're seeing him, you're listening to him. And, you know, he did not come across as somebody that's just going to make this up on no. a whim for no reason. And he caught a lot of grief. He yeah. got a lot of grief for saying what he did. And, um, you know, but then he came out with his book in uh, 2014, Let the Drums Speak. And he has a chapter dedicated to the Ringo Starr controversy. And Bernard does not back off the story. He says that he drummed on 21 songs on the the early albums. So somebody could say, well, you know, they, they released 77 songs over the first seven albums. So does that mean that Ringo drummed on 50 of them? No, it doesn't mean that at all. I don't think Ringo drummed on any of those songs. And if you listen very, you know, very closely, listen to the drumming, it's the timekeeping is very precise. It's precision. Yeah. And so what that means is that they had other session drummers, aside from Bernard and aside from Andy White. And like we said, we don't know. Maybe Andy White drummed on a lot of the early stuff. They just told us about two songs, Love Me Do and P.S. I Love You. And then when you listen to the drumming after uh, Revolver, which was the last of the first seven albums, you hear different drumming. 
And in fact, if you listen to Lady Madonna, I, that's not Ringo on Lady Madonna. That's not Ringo. And in, in my view, I mean, it, again, we're back to very precise timekeeping, very tight drumming. So I do think Ringo drummed on songs, starting with Sgt. Pepper. But even then, he was paging in and out. We know Billy drummed on songs in the White Album. Mm -hmm. Back in the USSR, Dear Prudence, Martha, My Dear. Uh, he did the Ballad of John and Yoko. Billy drumming on that song, which wasn't on the White Album, but later on, you know, I don't know. But then, Mike, you weren't done there because, again, you did this whole presentation based on a uh, DVD. I think it's called The Deconstructing of Rubber Soul. Yeah. But then, Mike, you know, I was a little uh, I was a little astute here, too, because now you're showing the time uh, line on the albums that followed. And I'm looking at I'm looking at the presentation and I'm like, wait a minute. The White Album. Yeah. Yeah, the white album doesn't matter. I saw that before you even said it. Now nobody, Mike, has said this prior to you before. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So what I wanted to do was I didn't want people to um, to accuse me of just uh, going after the biological Paul period, right? So they were like, "Oh, he just he just loves Billy, so he's going to you know deep six, no pun intended." <laughs> biological Paul. And so I said, you know, so I'm going to take a look at one of the later albums. And I didn't want to choose Pepper because I already knew that Sergeant Pepper was uh, was Billy's baby and it was tightly controlled by Billy and George Martin. So I said, let me let me move to something after that. So I, let's take a look at the White Album. And I had known that, you know, the story was that the White Album, the songs of the White Album, most of them were written while they were in India mm -hmm. with the Maharishi, that retreat. And even Wikipedia says the songs were written, uh, most of the songs are written in the March, April timeframe. Over 30. Over 30. And one site said that they wrote 48. Okay. What they don't tell you in the story is that the Beatles' time in India was staggered. They arrived in mid February, all four Beatles around mid February. Ringo was gone by March 1st. I'm doing this by memory. Billy was gone by March 15th or the or the very least the latter part of March and George and John stayed eight weeks they left mid-April now while they were in India we all know that they were doing meditation and there were other activities at the retreat how is it possible that as a band that they wrote over 30 songs when one of the primary songwriters Billy aka Paul McCartney was out of there in March mid to late March. And then John was out of there after eight weeks. So you're going, to, you're going to tell us that they wrote 30 plus songs when we can't even say eight weeks because half the band wasn't even there for eight weeks. It's another story that when you put it under the microscope and you scrutinize it, it doesn't hold together. The Beatles did not write 30 plus songs in India because they didn't have the time to do it. And then, you know, with the 50th anniversary release of the White Album, we get the Escher demos. And these are allegedly the demos that the Beatles did leading into the White Album recording sessions, which started on May 30th, 1968. And we are told that on a single day in May of 1968, prior to recording, they went to George Harrison's bungalow mm -hmm. and they laid down 27 songs in a single day. and. The day is unknown. This is the most remarkable thing. It's like the photo shoot for Rubber Soul. Yeah. I could not find a specific date for the photo shoot for Rubber Soul. Why is that? It's one of the most iconic photo albums of all time, and yet we have no exact date for it. Why is that? Well, I would posit it's because if we give you a date, you're going to start looking at the timeline. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's the same thing with the Escher demos, right? We don't have a date. And one of the sites, uh, the Beatles Bible, clearly says that there is no date. And I thought to myself, okay, this is very, very strange. So again, one of the most iconic Beatle albums of all time, the White Album, there's a demo of songs of which I think it was 19 of the 27 songs recorded that day ended up on the White Album. Some ended up on Abbey Road, and some of them actually never got released. Some later on in, in, in their solo career, like Not Guilty. How could we not have a date for that? And so, um, so I concluded that there were no 27 songs recorded in a single day. 
that the 27 songs, yes, there are demos. Of course, we have them. We have the recordings. But what they were was rehearsals over a period of time. Yeah. What that period of time is, I have no idea. It could be one month, two months, three months, four months, but it wasn't a single day. Jeez. It's not credible. So with the White Album, the 30 plus songs written in India, they had a staggered stay there. That's not credible. The 27 songs in one day for the White Album, the Escher demos, that's not credible. So what happened? So I, again, I applied the template that they used for Rubber Soul, which said that the songs were, were written. They were in process. And it's not to say they, they didn't record some of the songs during the White Album sessions. In other words, you know, Billy didn't record and write and all that stuff, or John wasn't on recordings or George wasn't on recordings. It doesn't mean that. It just means that by the time they got into the White Album sessions, beginning May 30th of 1968, the stage was already set. And it's possible that a lot of those songs were already recorded and that they overlaid the vocals. And there were other times where they did record and did the vocals. But I think with the White Album, what we have is, I think we have a mix of songs that were written by songwriters outside of the Beatles, plus songs that were actual compositions by the Beatles. And I believe we do have John and George actually writing songs and recording on the White Album. That's what I, I concluded. But it's a mix. It's a mix of the Beatles and a mix of not the Beatles on the White Album as far as musically playing. You know, one of the last things you have on the presentation, and again, what could this mean? What does this mean? But, man, you know, you present all of this so beautifully, Mike. And Mike, how many slides were involved in this? It was like 100 and... 50 or something, 140. Just incredible. But one of the last things after this entire presentation is John Lennon saying the music is a myth. Yeah. Yeah. Rolling Stone magazine. What does that mean? Right. John said in Rolling Stone magazine that he kept talking about the Beatles myth. And, you know, back in 1971, I think the interview was in 71, you would read that and a lot of people just glossed over it. You know, what, what does it mean? Today, we have a much better understanding of what that means. And again, you know, we have John telling us of all the Beatles, John was probably the one that was actually spilling the beans the most. And in that Rolling Stone magazine and also the, uh, the Playboy interview in 1980 was another one where he was just dropping bombs. And in, in those interviews, uh, whether it was the Rolling Stone one or the Playboy one, I forgot, but he said they were craftsmen. craftsmen. Right, right. And he said that by the time the Beatles got to the U.S., they were already old hands, which meant they were already like seasoned veterans at doing what they did. And what they did, their task was to take the songs that were written, not by them. We're talking about the first seven albums, was to learn them and then take it out on tour. They were the veneer. They were the front men for these songs. That's what their craft was. See, John didn't say we were songwriters. Mm -hmm. John didn't say we were composers. John said we were craftsmen. Mm -hmm. That's kind of a very strange way to word what it is that you do, because that's John's way of telling us. Also, craftsman is, is a, a term that we associate with Freemasonry. So a, a Freemason is a craftsman, the craft. And so I think John was basically giving us two clues who they were, what club they belonged to, and what it is that they were doing. Mike, I want to read something. I got a couple of things to read to you. One of them blows me away, man. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong about this. This was kind of like 1969, and the, uh, the uh, you know, Billy Shears, Billy Shepard conspiracy was really starting to take hold, Okay. Correct me if I'm if I'm wrong. Life magazine went out to Paul McCartney's f a farm in Scotland, yeah, to try to find out if there was any meat to this. Correct so far? Yeah. Okay. Now, from what I gather, McCartney Billy was first, you know, paparazzi get away from me, blocking himself from the camera. But then I heard that I guess they took some shot, some shots of him that he wasn't too pleased and he wasn't too happy with. 
So in exchange for them not printing those photos, he agreed to do a interview with them. I, I've got two excerpts from the interview and one really blows me away. My, my first question to you before I read this first one is, do you believe like once the, the Beatles were under the thumb of Tavistock? Yeah. Were they under the thumb of Tavistock until the day the brand, the, until the day the band dissolved? Yeah, I believe what? they were. Yeah. What, yeah. What? I mean, what happened was, what happened was they were, um, you know, they are a Tavistock creation. And so they are a, a Tavistock project. So in the early days, it came under the uh, the guidance and the direction of George Martin. Okay. And then the the baton was handed to Billy. Okay. Starting in 1967 with Sergeant Pepper, but what we have to understand is that they all work within. They all work for, I should say, on behalf of of the pyramid of power, right? Of Tavistock's agenda, which is what I talked about, which was the human potential movement, the Aquarian conspiracy, which then made its way into the New Age movement and so on. Right. It's you know this uh, this enlightenment that they talk about. And so, yes. So the, the answer to your question, Vince, is yes. They they continue to work in the pyramid. Listen to this quote, Mike. And I, you, you, you know all these, <laughs> but I've read this. And now yeah. know, knowing what I know from you, I'm like, this is really interesting. This is from that Life 1971 article. Here's what he said. You see, there was a partnership contract put together years ago to hold us together as a group for 10 years. Anything anybody wanted to do, put out a record, anything, he had to get the other's permission. Because of what we were then, none of us ever looked at it when we signed it. We signed it in 67 and discovered it last year. So about 71 now. We discovered this contract that bound us for 10 years. So it's, oh gosh, oh gal, oh golly, oh heck, you know. Now, now boys can tear it up, please. But the trouble is the other three have been advised not to tear it up. They've been advised that if they tear it up, there will be serious bad consequences for them. The point, though, to me was that it began to look like a three to one vote, which is what, in fact, happened at a couple of business meetings. It was three to one. And then he goes into Alan Klein. But do you think he's is he talking about a Tavistock contract that if they didn't live up to the contract, bad things were because it's funny to me. He says um, they had been advised not to tear it up. They've been advised that if they tear it up, there will be bad, serious consequences to them. He never said their lawyers advised them. Yeah, it's it's a very strange quote in that article. And, you know, it's it's hard to really put a finger on what exactly he's talking about. The only thing I could think of is that you know, they were all bound contractually as a band and what it is they could say, what they can do. I mean, they didn't have a lot of room. I mean, if you remember in my uh, presentation is a, is a clip uh, of George Harrison saying from the anthology DVD that they didn't have a vote in anything. Right. Yeah. I got that quote. Remember, yeah, yes. remember that, right? Yes. 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 And, and yep. so I, I think that what Billy's alluding to there is that I think at that point, everybody, were, everybody was making decisions for us. That's what he said. Yes. Yes. Right. Exactly. Yes. And so I think what happened was as they pushed on, especially within, you know, into phase three, which was 67 through 70, there was a lot of, I think, terse moments between them that they got along. It was like love hate type of thing, right? They, they got along. I talk about they, I mean, Billy got along with the other three, the other three got along with him, but there were times when they didn't get along. And part of the reason for that is because Billy's work ethic, he was a perfectionist or he still yeah. is. Right. And, and this is something that John even mentions in interviews that he would say, Paul was a perfectionist and he's referring to Billy and that clashed with them. And uh, cause Billy wanted things to click along and he wanted everybody on a tight leash because he had to manage this thing. The other three perhaps were starting to really, really tire of the rigor. Yeah. 
maybe even talking about, you know what, this is just a, a farce. And they couldn't come out and say anything because if they did, there would have been severe repercussions for it. What it would have been, I don't know. I, I believe it probably could have meant very significant legal issues, probably retraction of financial gains, because all of this stuff would have been predicated on them keeping to the terms and conditions of the contracts that they signed. Yeah. So if they started flapping their lips, it would have been a big problem. Yeah. You know, that's you why know, when people say, how come they don't talk about it? Well, I, I think a big reason is because they could have lost everything. Yeah. Now, here's the best part to me, man. Keep in mind this 1971 Life article, the whole, the, the whole thing started off of the hoax and them trying to find out if there was any meat to this. This right. is the last thing he says, which blows me away because it's like, okay, they're coming. I don't want ha- I don't want to have anything to do with them. Well, I don't like some of the pictures. You know, you don't publish those pictures. I'll, I'll, I'll give you the story. Okay. Yeah. This is the last thing he says. So I think you've got to live your own life. That sounds like one of those statements, but it is, in fact, just very necessary to realize that. And particularly necessary for me, or else someone else is going to be living part of your life. Yeah. He goes, or else somebody else is going to be living part of your life for you. Yeah. What does that mean, right? Bro, like, (laughs) that's what they went there for. He tells them when it's all over, and it just just blew by them. Like, what the frick does that mean? If you're not living your life right now, Mike Williams, if you're not living the life of Mike Williams, then who is living the Mike Williams life? Right. An imposter it would have to be. Exactly. Exactly. That's why Vince, in the beginning of the the show, we said that he's been dropping clues since day one. If if you really read these interviews closely, the things that he says, the things that John had said, George and and Ringo, if if you listen to the interviews or you read them very closely, knowing what we know now, you can start to pick it apart, you know? And particularly necessary for me, or else someone else is going to be living part of your life for you. Right. You know what I noticed too, and it's one of the reasons I wanted to watch Help, and we'll end it on this. This is a little note, but one of the reasons I wanted to watch Help, because that's biological, Paul, Yeah, was did he do everything with his left hand? And he did. He did. Man, when you watch, like there are a lot of wing documentaries out there and stuff, he does everything with his right hand. And like, you know, Mike, I'm, I'm going to be 60. And the things he's doing with his right hand, even at my age, would be very awkward for me to do with my left hand. And like I said, when you look at those, everything was lefty, lefty, lefty. It just seemed later on when he let that guard down, he just comes across as a natural right-handed guy. I know it's a little thing, but it's very noticeable. No, that's one of the that's one of the things that we pick up on. See, when I started the presentation, one of the first two charts or so, I said one example by itself might not mean anything. Right. But a stream of evidence can be very significant. And I intentionally phrased it that way because Yes, we can sit there and say, we can make excuses all day as to why he's going lefty, righty, whatever it may be. But then when you pick up on that, and then you move to something else, and then something else, and something else, and then you start to see patterns forming. And then you have to apply common sense and logic and say, okay, something is up here. This does not look right. What they want us to do is they they want to distract us from, from doing that, from focusing on those little details, those little nuanced things that we pick up on and just kind of chalk them up as just doesn't really mean anything. It's like the article you just read. And there's many articles like that, right? We can read it and say, I don't think it really means anything. What's he talking about? Oh, I don't know. And then people just walk away from it. Yeah. But they're telling you. And um, it's been one crazy ride. I I could tell you that. Well, Mike, I can tell you this, man, this all started for me and you probably know the exact date. I'll never forget it, man. It had to be back in 90 in, in 67 or 68. F. Lee Bailey 
Yeah. The, the famous lawyer hosted a special in primetime TV all about this. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going full circle now, Mike, because here we are, what, 40, 50 years later. You blew F. Lee Bailey out of the water, Mike, with this uh, with this president. <laughs> Mike, this, this president. Man, Mike, this was magnificent, man. Magnificent. Yeah. Thank you, Vince. And I, it's it's hard to do it justice, you know, without without seeing the slide. Yeah. Yeah. You know, because to, to see the dates and everything else, it's kind of hard to picture. Let everybody head. know exactly where to go to see this, because guys, and, and and I recommend do an hour a night. Do exactly yeah. what I did. Do an hour a night. Break this thing up. But where do they go, Mike? Just go to my hub website, Sage of Quay. S A G E O F Q U A Y. Sage of Quay dot com, and then just page down a little bit. And um, actually, I actually added it to my my website, so you can just go there and see it, or you can just click the link to my Paul is Dead channel or my main YouTube channel, and you can actually watch it there as well. So it's up on BitChute. I have a BitChute account, but all the links to all of those uh, social media platforms are all on my Hub website, and you can just go there and click away. And You'll you have a it. you have a Patreon too, right, Mike? I have a Patreon. Yeah, it's it's anemic, but yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, if you go to my uh, hub website, you'll see the link there for my Patreon page as well. Well, I know what I'm going to do because there's no way you're done because we know Billy's <laughs> Billy's back is coming out in the summer. So here's what I'm going to do, and here's what everybody else is going to do because Mike Mike is the absolute best. Mike, I swear to God, you 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 you're such a great presenter you do all this without trying to sway anybody either way no you you present the fact and that's why i get so pissed off at you when you give us little tidbits about getting hate mail and this yeah. and that you are the most honest listen here's the information do what you want with the information. That's what I love about you. But here's here's what I know I'm gonna do because we could have talked about Corona for Three yeah. hours. Yeah. I would assume that's going to be heavily talked about now on the Sage of Quay, correct? I'm actually putting little blurbs out, short videos, you know, five to 10 minutes where I'm just trying to get people to kind of wake up and understand that what you're being shown on the mainstream media is not actually reality. And I'm trying to get people to connect dots that way. Yeah. I don't know how successful I'm going to be, but yeah. I'm trying to do that. I will, when Billy's back comes out, the summer, it's going right? to be summer, summer? Yeah, summer of this year. I will take a look at, at the footnotes and read through the book, and I will do a little something on that. I, I will. I will do something on that. But as far as major presentations on the Beatles, I'm not going to be doing any more major presentations because the way I look at it, Vince, is this has been step by step. The first thing was, let's talk about the memoirs of Billy Shears because of what's contained in the book. Let's talk about the fact that biological Paul McCartney was replaced by somebody. Then let's get into the occult aspects of the Beatles. They are immersed in the occult. That was like phase two. And phase three was the Beatles were not what we were told that they were at all, that they did not write all of their own music. And that's not to say they did not write some of their music, but they did not write all of the music we are told that they wrote. And so, you know, once I did this last presentation, like you said, four and a half hours, I thought to myself, well, where do I go from here? Really, where do I go from here? Some people still want me to talk about Paul is Dead Clues, but I, I responded back to them. I said, look, I'm, I'm past that. Mm -hmm. It's it's beyond that now. Uh, we've gotten into the occult. That was the next step. We've gotten kind of past that now. I have lots of shows that talk about the occult aspects of it. So if you're interested in that, you can watch that. And now I've gotten to the point where I'm like, okay, the whole thing was so fabricated to the point where it's even beyond comprehension for just about everybody. The good news is, though, that I was waiting for a real storm to just come my way because, you know, so many people love the Beatles, worship the Beatles. It's worship. It is. It's idol worship. And I was one of those people. So when I put this last presentation out, I thought, OK, here it comes. The tidal wave of hate and all that stuff is going to come. And uh, it didn't. It's been overwhelmingly positive, overwhelmingly. I've been driven to do this, Vince. There are many times along this journey where I questioned why I was doing this. I started to question, like, why am I doing this? I don't have to do this. I have other things in my life that I could be doing that are a lot more interesting than this. I mean, as far as giving me 
fulfillment in life. But there was this little voice in my head that said, keep going, keep going, keep going. You are almost there. Carry the ball one more yard and you're over the goal line. And that's how this has kind of played out. You know, and I had a lot of obstacles between last year to when I got this out. Um, a lot of things that transpired in my own personal life as far as uh, things that had to do with health and family members and everything else that I had to deal with. It was grueling. But finally, it's out and people can watch it and decide for themselves. If you don't agree, you don't agree. Well, you know, again, Mike, you say this all the time and you've said this with every presentation you've ever done. You you just provide the facts. And I think that's why you're not getting a, a, a negative backlash. I mean, you, you can't argue with these dates. These no. are real dates. These are real times. They're documented. You can't argue with them. I had somebody write me from within the music industry who watched the, the presentation and they said, you realize that nobody's going to be able to present the, the official narrative going forward without having to, in some fashion, address what you've put out. Mm -hmm. They can, I guess they can choose to ignore it. You know, that's an option, but they always run the risk that there's going to be somebody that has seen the presentation and is going to say, but what about the dates? Mm -hmm. What about the 16 songs in 30 days? What about the 30 plus songs in India? The 27 songs on some unknown day in May for the White Album. Mm -hmm. How about the Mercy Beat article? What's what's that about? Do we just gloss over that? Mm -hmm. Was that also like somebody writing something that, that they wrote the wrong thing down and it got published? Mm -hmm. You know, it, it gets to a point where you, you can't continue to dodge the bullet on this thing. You know, when I, the article about them being in a haze of marijuana during the filming of Help, that not only affected the filming of Help, but that also affected any storyline that had to do with writing music during that period. Mm -hmm. yeah. So these are all things that now going forward, this is what this person told me. They said, it's, it's going to have to be dealt with. Um, so, you know, I, and I felt good about that. And, uh, but I didn't do this to, to throw a monkey wrench into anything. I really didn't. I, I just did it because I found it interesting to look at this and then think to myself, how come nobody else ever counted up the days? Yeah. 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 You know, yeah. and, and I look, and I'm guilty of it. I didn't. It's yeah. just, I happened to be watching that DVD, which by the way, is very well presented. Scott Fryman does a great job on the DVD, but it is the official narrative. That's a wonderful job on it. But I remember watching it and then a light bulb went off and I said, okay, hold on a second. The tires screeched. I'm like, oh, this didn't happen. And that's, that's what set me on the path. Yeah. You know? Well, Mike, you've, uh, I mean, to every fan of the Beatles and anybody who's been following this story for decades, man, it, it wouldn't have been the same without you. I, I mean, I am so happy I stumbled upon you. I'm so happy we got to become friends. I, I'm going to be the first one knocking on the door in the summer. Yeah. The first one, Mike, <laughs> tell me about this. What does this mean? What I, the, the, the thing I love too, like, especially when you get into the books is, Man, all the information's in the footnotes. Yeah. And you have a way of really just dissecting those that are, first of all, I'm too old. I can't even read the print. It's so small. <laughs> yeah, well, Vince, I got readers too. <laughs> <laughs> but Mike, man, I can't thank you enough. Um, man, I hope to have you on here. We could discuss any other topic. Yeah. Um, I, I just, I, I, I love you as a podcaster. Um, I love you as an information provider, man. And I just want you to know, I personally, man, thank you for this incredible, incredible work that you've done. Thank you, Vince. Thank you for having me on the show. This is the agreement we had too, folks. I told Vince he'd be the very first one to to talk to me about the presentation. That was way back, I think, October of, of last year. Yeah. And That's how long forget. ago. You didn't forget. I did not forget. I keep yeah. to my commitments. Yeah. Well, everybody, it's sageofquay.com. You can go there and that will lead you to all the places that you need to be. Uh, Mike Williams, thank you for allowing me to experience this through your eyes. It's been an amazing, amazing trip. Thank you, Vince. All right. I will see everybody next time.
change the 